to sit bolt upright in bed. Sweat is dripping from your brow. You are shaken to your very core. You have just experienced the nightmare of your life. But you have this strange feeling that it's real. But there's nothing fake about it. You try to go back to sleep, but you can't. And finally, you resign yourself to the fact that what you have just experienced is no dream, no nightmare. It's reality. God has just asked you to sacrifice your only son. I can't even imagine what was going through the mind of Abraham that night as he struggled with faith and doubt, as he wrestled with what he had just experienced in this communication with God. I would invite you to open your Bibles this morning as we continue our Heaven's Hall of Fame sermon series. And we take a look at the story, this particular aspect of the story, of the life of Abraham. Would you join me in turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And we are going to take a look at the story for today from the life of Abraham. Abraham chapter 22, uh, Abraham and Isaac journeyed some 70 miles from Beersheba to the mountain region of Moriah. And while they were there, the events of Genesis 22 take place. And here's how it starts. We're going to pick it up with verse 2. Then he said, that is God, to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Unbelievable. You can only imagine now why Abraham thought he was having a nightmare. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham, verse 5, said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now, it's interesting to discover the language there in um, this uh, verse here, in verse chapter 5 of Genesis 22. Abraham actually uses... Um, the, the, the tense of the verb he uses, we will come back to you, is very emphatic in the original language. God has just asked Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son. The heir of the promise. And as Abraham is speaking to the others there, his servants, uh, before he heads off to uh, Mount Moriah. He uses very emphatic language here. He says, again, I will go yonder and worship, and we, we, he's going with Isaac, but he says, we will come back to you. And the English language doesn't even do it justice as it does in the original Hebrew. 
It's very emphatic. We will come back. And so even though Abraham has just been asked to sacrifice his son, uh, he has this understanding of faith that if God has told him that Isaac would be the fulfillment of this, pro of this promise that he had given to Isaac, uh, uh, given to Abraham, that he would be the father of a great nation. By faith, he comes to understand that God, even though he has asked him to sacrifice his one and only son, will do something miraculous. Because I don't know about you, but I would be seriously upset if I were Abraham. And I'm sure he was. I'm sure he had heavy struggles, that he struggled between faith and doubt. We understand that from the life situation of Abraham up to this point in time. But here he is. We will come back to you. In verse 6, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Verse 7, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? This was probably not a new experience for Isaac. This young man had probably experienced with his father many times before the process of the sacrificial system. They had probably... He had probably accompanied his father before in offering a lamb as a sacrifice. And so here he is. Hey, Dad, we've got the fire. We've got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham gives an interesting response in verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. I, I can't even imagine what is going on here. Not only the faith of Abraham, but the faith of Isaac. This young man, you know, uh, was born in the old age of Abraham. Certainly, Isaac could have outrun his dad to escape. But he submits himself to his father, and his hands are bound, his feet are bound, he is laid on this altar, and there God presents him, or, or Isaac, uh, Abraham presents him to God as a sacrifice. In Abraham, verse 10, stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. It's interesting. This conversation that God is now having with Abraham, he says, for now, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. As you look at the story of Abraham from the moment it, uh, his life unfolds in Genesis chapter 12, the previous 10 chapters of the book of Genesis, you can see it doesn't paint a real pretty picture of Abraham. Yes, there are some high points, but there are some really bad low points. There's some seriously bad stuff, folks. And so God is testing Abraham, and he says, So now, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham uh, went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, verse 14, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. 
Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Wow. A powerful story. Kind of a scary one, too. So here's the question. What does the life of Father Abraham and his journey teach us? I would like to propose seven things that I believe the life of Father Abraham teaches us. Things that we would do well to pay attention to. First of all, the life of Father Abraham teaches that our past doesn't matter. Our past doesn't matter. Why did God choose Abraham? I mean, take a look at his life. He clearly, as, as, as I said before, there was some pretty messy stuff in the previous 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. I mean, in that period of time, Abraham violates both the seventh commandment and the ninth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20 and verse 14. And Exodus 20 and verse 16. You shall not bear false witness. On two different occasions, he was dishonest with the Pharaoh of Egypt and with Abimelech, king of Gear, regarding the fact that Sarah was his wife. You remember that story. He lied to Pharaoh. He lied to Abimelech. He said, hey, listen, I, you know, he told Sarah, hey, come on, go along with me, man. He says, I'm fearful that if I, if I tell these guys that you're really my wife, they're going to they're gonna kill me. So let's tell them you're my sister. And, of course, you all know that she was a half-sister of Abraham. So he was telling a half-truth. But he lied to Pharaoh. He lied to Abimelech. And you know the consequences if you don't go back and read the stories. It was pretty messy. It was pretty ugly. And it kind of gave a bad impression of who God was. And yet Abraham was supposedly God's servant. He was called by God. God called him to inhabit this promised land. He had given him this call while he was in Ur of the Chaldees. And yet Abraham didn't paint a very pretty picture of God. He didn't trust God. He lied to Pharaoh and Abimelech. And then he violated the seventh commandment because he committed adultery with Hagar when he did not trust that God would provide the promise of, of the, uh, that he would be the father of a great nation uh, through Sarah. We're talking some serious stuff here, folks. You know, um, I don't care who you are. If any one of us here today did what Abraham did, it'd cause a major ruckus. Think about it. And if you don't think it matters, even in our society, I mean, take a look around us in the political realm, even in Hollywood. I mean, there have been some people that have gotten some, in some serious trouble and there are some serious hot water, both through their sexual impropriety and through their dishonesty. What about the big scam that's going on right now with Lori Loughlin and her husband over this scam to college entrance stuff? People who have been involved in, in uh, uh, sexual abuse, yeah. Our society doesn't accept it. Whether they have Christian values or not, they do not accept this stuff. And so what we're talking about here with Abraham was some pretty serious stuff. 
because he was supposedly a follower of God. At times in his life, Abraham had led others to believe that he was something that he was not. I mean, can you imagine him? Here is Abraham. He comes strutting into Egypt. And he leads Pharaoh to believe that he is somebody that he is not. He leads Pharaoh to believe that he's a follower of God, but there were some serious issues on the inside. Some of you have heard the story of what recently happened to Pastor Jan and myself. Many of you have known that for many months we have been planning the remodel of our kitchen at home. And this has been in the planning stages for many, many months. And so last December, in anticipation of our springtime remodel, we went out and decided we were going to do some appliance shopping. We needed a new oven. Her oven was absolutely shot. And so we went to various places around. We went to the typical places you go to do appliance shopping. And then we went over to Pacific Sales in Thousand Oaks. And uh, we began to talk with the uh, person there, found out that she was the manager of Pacific Sales. Uh, in the course of the conversation, uh, she asked if we lived around here, and we said, yes, Simi Valley. And, you know, she was making talk to us as we were going around and looking at her various ovens. And, and uh, she asked, uh, what was my profession? And I told her that I was a pastor. And she says, oh, really? She says, what denomination? I said, Seventh-day Adventist. She said, no kidding. And I said, yes. She said, oh, she says, well, you know, I'm a Christian. My family, we're Christian believers. We're not Seventh-day Adventists. But we sent our son to Newberry Park Adventist Academy. And she says, I don't have enough good to say about you Seventh-day Adventists. So here she is, Kathy, the manager of Pacific Sales, and she's taking us through uh, there to look at the various ovens. And oh, my goodness, some of the ovens that she was uh, showing us, I was saying to myself, um, I didn't say to her, I said, uh, Kathy, I told you that I was a pastor. I'm not, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, big businessman that makes big bucks. I mean, she was showing us ovens that were seven, eight, nine thousand dollars and we said, hey, we're going to have to tone it down a little bit. And so she was showing us, I had mentally in my mind that, you know, maybe we'd spend two thousand dollars on an oven. You know, that's still a lot of money. And so she's taking us around. She says, well, maybe you might want a floor model. She says, you know, in fact, I've got just the floor model for you. And she took us over to this area. She says, we've had this on display for some time now, and they're, they're wanting us to clear it out. She says, and we'll make a special deal for you. She says, it's a Samsung double oven, 30 inches wide. It was exactly what Pastor Jan wanted. She says, it has many features that high-end commercial ovens have. She says, in fact, its retail value is $4,000. And I gulped, and I thought, whoa, she's going to have to seriously discount it. She says, it's been sitting here on the floor, and she says, uh, uh, they aren't discontinuing the model, but she says, we do need to clear it out. And she says, it also has a scratch on it. If you look down here in the bottom, there's a scratch. And we looked at it and thought, well, maybe we could live with it if they offer us the right price. And so she said, uh, uh, we've had this oven uh, marked down, our display model, uh, to, I think she said something like $2,600. And we thought, wow, that's a good deal. But she says, now, it's December 31st. And she says, we will give you a very special deal. We will discount it further. Pastor Jan and I bought and paid for it, $1,800 for a $4,000 oven. Now, that was still a lot of money, but this was an amazing oven. Now, some of you know this story because there are at least two of you here uh, that helped me unload that oven when I went to pick it up and brought it and stuck it in my garage where it sat from early January till just about three weeks ago when we went to install it. And when we went to install the oven, there was something very interesting that we discovered. I've got a picture here that I want to show you of the oven. We can take a look. Here's the oven. We actually installed it. You can see the lights on uh, in the oven, uh, the, the rack, a beautiful, beautiful oven. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, the picture uh, on the right here, you can see the clock works and everything. But when we got it all in there and wired up and everything good to go, 
We turned it on, and it said, uh, I set the temperature to 350 degrees. And uh, it showed 150 and that it was on its way up. And about 90 seconds later, it started flashing this error message on the screen. I'm thinking, oh, no, this can't be good. And uh, I shut it down, and I tried it again. We flipped the breaker and tried to reset things and did the same thing. Same story. So I was concerned. I immediately called Samsung's customer care, and I said, hey, something's not right here. And they said, give us the make, the model number, the serial number, all of that kind of stuff, and, uh, and, and we'll see what we can do. And so the guy told me, he says, that's not a good error message. Uh, he says, that error message is in indicative of something that's going seriously wrong on the inside of your oven. And so he says, I'll tell you what, he says, uh, this is under warranty, and he said, so we'll dispatch um, a, uh, a repairman out to take a look at it, but you need to know that it's going to be a week before you get a repairman. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So I said, okay, we'll go ahead and accept that. And then I called Pacific Sales, and I'm talking with the people there at Pacific Sales. Kathy, the manager who had uh, dealt with me, she had kind of turned me over to one of their, her assistants there, Brandon, and he was helping me uh, with this. And so I called him, and I said, Brandon, I said, I don't know what's going on here. And I explained it to him, and he says, give me again the model number and the serial number. And he says, let me research it. And so he, um, uh, he waited. Uh, uh, that was, uh, I think, a Friday morning that I called him. And I didn't hear from him again until Sunday morning, just a couple of weeks ago. We can have that picture back up again. Um, he said uh, in his email that he wrote me on Sunday, the 27th, I believe, of, of um, or 26th, rather, of, of May, he said, Phil, he says, you are not going to believe this. He says, but in talking to our Samsung rep and researching your model number and the serial number, <clears throat> we sold you a dummy oven. He said, it will never work. And I'm thinking, say what? And so... Uh, that was a Sunday morning, and later that afternoon, Pastor Jan and I drove over there, and we walked in, and there's Kathy, the, the, the manager, and uh, Br uh, Brandon, who met us, and I said, you know, we need to talk about this. And he says, yes, he says, we did some research, and he says, we discovered that that's a fake oven. It will never, ever work. And I said, oh, my goodness, it, it looks real, man. Lights come on, the digital dial, all of that kind of stuff. And he said, it's fake. In many respects, Father Abraham had been a fake. To Pharaoh, to Abimelech, he looked real. on the outside, but he didn't have what he needed on the inside. They told me there at Pacific Sales that this particular oven, while it had the heating elements in it, in it and everything, that it lacked the necessary wiring harness to make it work. Oh, it would work on the 110 side, but it would not pull the high power that it needed to juice the oven and make it heat. In 1973, when my father was prolific in writing his poetry, he wrote a poem that some of you have heard me share before. It is so appropriate in the context of this oven and even in the light of the life of Father Abraham. Dad called it the allegory of the imitation. The Lord does not see as man sees. Men judge by appearances, but the Lord judges by the heart, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. A bouquet of flowers with a basket of fruit displayed on a table one day brought cheers of delight for this marvelous sight made the folks feel so happy and gay. 
But someone discovered, to the surprise of them all, that the beautiful flowers and fruit were not real, you see, but were just meant to be like a picture one hangs on a wall. On another fine day in the bright month of May, on that very same table displayed, stood a vase filled with tulips of colors so rare and sweet tropical fruit on a plate. Then someone came by and he said with a sigh as he gazed on the things that he saw, it is surely a shame for someone to claim these flowers and fruit are for real, for it is not hard to see in the mango a flaw and the red of the tulips so pale. Scarce this moment had passed when the expert was cast in a comedy hard to believe, for a towhead came by with a glint in his eye and a hunger as big as his feet. He took up some fruit and a tulip to boot. He bit in that mango so sweet, it was tasty and bright, a real gourmet's delight. The expert's face shone red as a beet. Now the moral is this in this story of bliss is life's pathway of travel, you sport. You can't always tell by the look or the smell. It's what's inside that's the thing of import. And like our dummy oven that looked normal on the outside but didn't have what was necessary on the inside, there were times in Abraham's life that he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside to make him fire up. But in spite of the past, God was still willing to use Father Abraham. And I don't know about you, friends, but all I can say is this gives me hope. Because you see, your past, your past doesn't matter when you accept Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen to that. God is more interested in our future than he is in our past. Hallelujah. So the first lesson we learn from this story of Father Abraham is that the life of Father Abraham teaches us that our past doesn't matter. And lesson number two, the life of Father Abraham teaches us that God expects obedience. For many of us, that word obedience is pejorative. It, it has all kinds of negative connotations to us. And, and to some of us, we think of it in legalistic terms. But is obedience legalism? What if your children refuse to obey you? because they told you you were being too legalistic? Or what about if uh, you're an employer and you tell one of your employees to do something in a certain way and they say, oh no, listen, I think you're being too legalistic. What would you say? Should we expect any less from God? It's not legalistic to be obedient to God. If love is the motivator. You see, God didn't say to Abraham, that's okay, Abraham, that you've got sin in your life. You just keep right on doing what you're doing. I love you anyway. I'm not saying that I believe God's love is conditional based on our behavior. What I'm saying is that while God meets us where we're at, he doesn't want us to stay where we're at. Remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? He said, he said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Rather, the woman caught in adultery. Because of, of Abraham's love for God, he chose to be obedient when God asked him to sacrifice his only son. And God is calling us to have that same kind of obedience God expected obedience from Abraham, and he expects obedience from us. And I think the reason why this obedience thing troubles us is because we've tried so many times to be obedient on our own, and it doesn't work. But let me remind you about the good news, folks. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, you've heard me share this passage of Scripture many times before, and it's one we should never forget for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's about the righteousness of Christ. It's not about ours. 
It's about allowing Jesus to be obedient in us and through us. It's not about our own personal obedience. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I, the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, we can't be obedient on our own. We must depend on the righteous obedience of Jesus Christ, which leads to our next lesson, number three. The life of Father Abraham teaches us about the plan of salvation. When sin entered the world, God established the sacrificial system, which pointed forward to the coming Messiah. And up to this point in time, the sacrifice involved the death of an innocent lamb. I believe God took Abraham through this experience to allow him to understand the personal agony that he would go through in offering his own son as a sacrifice for sin. What a graphic portrayal of the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, how shall, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God is willing, my friends, was willing not only to sacrifice his son, his only son, Jesus, but through him, look at the salvation that he's willing to bring to you and me. The question is, are we willing to accept his substitutionary atonement? Lesson number four. The life of of Father Abraham reaches, teaches us rather, about our need for a relationship with Christ. I've heard it, I've said it, and you probably have too. How do I know when God is talking to me? How did Abraham know that it was God talking to him? It was a matter of relationship. When I'm out and about, and my cell phone rings, how do I know that it's my dear wife, Jan, on the other end? Well, some of you say caller ID. But listen, folks, I don't have to remind you, in this day of crazy telemarketer scamming and stuff, people are hijacking your phone numbers all the time. I get that happening all the time. People have hijacked my number. I'll get a call from somebody and say, hey, I just missed a call from you. Yeah, come to find out it was a scam call. How is it that I know that it's my dear wife on the other end? It's because I recognize her voice. And why do I recognize her voice? It's because I have a daily relationship with her. When God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, he didn't have the benefit of caller ID, but frankly, Abraham didn't need it because he knew God. He had a relationship with him. As flawed as he was, he had a relationship with God. When God called, Abraham recognized his voice. Oh, that each of us would have that kind of relationship with God. When he calls, we would hear him. The psalmist said, today, or Psalm 95 and verses 7 and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And Job said this in Job 14. You shall call and I will answer. Oh, that we would have that same kind of spirit of Job. Lesson number five from the life of Father Abraham. It teaches us about trust in God. See, by faith, Abraham, Hebrews 11, says, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham didn't have a clue how God was going to take care of this situation, but he trusted God even when he couldn't see the future. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. 
And that's a hard thing for many of us to do. But like Father Abraham, God is calling us to trust him when we see and when we can't see. Proverbs chapter 5, 3, rather, verses 5 and 6. Many of you know it. Say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Louisa Steed was born in England in the mid-1800s and accepted Christ at the age of nine. She immigrated to the U.S. in 1871 where she settled in Cincinnati, Ohio. At a camp meeting, she volunteered to go as a missionary to China. However, she was rejected because of her health. She eventually married, and a, a few years later, while on summer vacation to the beach at Long Island, New York, with her husband and her four-year-old daughter, she eyewitnessed an incredible personal tragedy. In a daring attempt to rescue a boy who was struggling against the undertow. Her husband swam out to help him and in the process lost his own life. Devastated and without adequate support, she and her daughter Lily had little to live on. One day things were so bad, there was no food in the house. Louisa poured out her heart to God and the next morning her prayer was answered when she found a basket of food and an envelope with several dollars left at her doorstep. And that experience led Louisa to pen the words to a hymn that we sing today, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. The life of Father Abraham teaches us to trust God. Number six, the life of Abraham teaches us about sacrifice. Abraham was willing to surrender his most valuable possession to God. In this, Abraham demonstrates the ultimate act of generosity. Referring to this story of Abraham and Isaac, Ellen White made this statement in an article in June 6, uh, in the June 6, 1901 issue of Youth Instructor Magazine. She said, the lesson was given to shine down through the ages that we may learn that there is nothing too precious to be given to God. It is when we look upon every gift as the Lord's to be used in his service that we secure the heavenly benediction. Give back to God your entrusted possessions and more will be entrusted to you. Keep your possessions to yourself and you will receive no reward in this life and will lose the reward of the life to come. Look at the world's redeemer and remember that as he, sa as he sacrificed, so must we. What would you do if God asked you to sacrifice like he did Abraham? Maybe God isn't asking you to sacrifice your child to him. But it doesn't mean that he's not asking you to sacrifice something. Is God asking you to sacrifice? And more importantly, are you willing to sacrifice? Perhaps you haven't been a faithful steward in returning an honest tithe or offerings to the Lord. Maybe he's asking you to sacrifice a habit, an attitude, your time, your life. I don't know what he's asking you to sacrifice. It's different for all of us. The point is, are we willing to obey when he asks us to sacrifice? That's the question. Lesson number seven. The life of Father Abraham teaches us that God will provide and bless. Genesis 22, verses 14 and 17. And Abraham called the, na uh, the name of the place the Lord will provide. 
As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Blessing I will bless you and multiply and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess uh, the gate of their enemies. How many of us stress out trying to live tomorrow when we haven't even gotten through today? God will provide and bless there's no need for us to stress about life when we're living in Christ. Pastor Jan and I were there in Pacific Sales talking with the manager, Kathy, about this great dilemma with this fake oven that we had been sold. Brandon, her assistant, was immediately trying to remedy the situation, and he says, you know, he says, oh, we have such and such another floor model that we could uh, deliver to them, or we could give them this other floor model. And quickly, Kathy responded, she says, Brandon, you know that either of those two models are not the quality of the one that we allegedly sold them. This $4,000 Samsung oven has many features of upper end, seven and $8,000 uh, commercial grade ovens. She says, we can't do this to them. But she was quietly sitting there behind her keyboard, punching in numbers, and I was patiently, we were patiently waiting for her response. She said, Pastor, she said, let me tell you something. She says, that oven is a $4,000 oven. We usually sell it every day for $3,800. Right now, we have it on a Memorial Day special for our lowest price of the season of $3,300. She says, the oven actually costs Pacific Sales $2,600 from Samsung. She says, if I sell you a new oven, if I give you a new oven to replace that one, for $1,800, she says, I am giving it to you for $1,500 less than our current sale price. She says, Pacific Sales isn't going to buy that. She says, at least not without some serious explanation. And she says, I don't have the authority to make that decision. But she says, I know that everything's going to turn out okay. And I said, I do too. I said, I'll wait to hear back from you. As we're preparing to walk out, she said, Pastor, I want to tell you, she says, if we had had this conver if I had had this conversation with most any other client, she says, I guarantee you that the tenor of the conversation would not have been what it's been with you. She said there would have been anger, probably profanities. She says, we're going to take care of you. Two weeks ago tomorrow, Pacific Sales delivered us a brand new oven. Show the picture. A brand new oven, and it got installed. Now, I'm going to tell you, folks, one of those ovens is the fake, and one of them is the real. And unless I, I tell you, you won't be able to know which one it is. Because both of them have a, a, the appearance of being real. I have to look to see which one it is. Uh, it's the oven on the left is the real oven. And the only way I can tell is that the backsplash on the oven on the right, you can see, has not been completed. But they look identical. They delivered us a brand new, out of the box, brought it, took it right out of the box there. No scratches, $4,000 oven, $1,800, didn't charge us another dime. God provided for our needs. He took care of us. And God will take care of you just like he took care of Abraham. So what have we learned from the story of Father Abraham? Again, quickly, let me review those. The life of Father Abraham teaches that our past doesn't matter, teaches us that God expects obedience, teaches us about the plan of salvation, teaches us about our need for a relationship with Christ, teaches us about trust in God, teaches us about sacrifice, and teaches us that God will provide and bless. Hebrews chapter 11 says this in the Hall of Fame chapter. 
Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should, after receive foreign inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went, but by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a land, in, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And the Apostle Paul wrote this of Father Abraham in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Here's what we can learn from Father Abraham today. That no matter what you've done, God loves you and can change your life if you are willing to accept his righteousness in exchange. Today, Jesus is calling you to accept his righteous life and the power of his Holy Spirit at work in you and through you. Our fake oven would never work because it didn't have the necessary power to make it work. I can tell you that our new oven works just just fine. In fact, sadly, the first item that was prepared in our brand new oven, in the process of installing it, we got it all in place and we were having struggles with the door. And we were working that door and finally got the door in place and the oven in there. And Pastor Jan told me, she says, you know, it says that we should fire up the oven and it should bake for uh, an hour at a high temperature to bake all the smells out of it. And so pff, I whipped on the oven, fired it up, and it started smelling. About five, seven minutes later, it started smelling. I opened the bottom thing, and folks, I had baked my cell phone at 350 for 10 minutes. So I know that the oven works. So here's the lesson, my friends. Do you have what it takes to work? Because you can look really good on the outside. But unless you have the power of God's spirit working in you, you're just a fake. Let's not be like that oven. Let's not be like Father Abraham was. Let's be like who he became as he accepted the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your amazing grace and your amazing love. Thank you for the lessons of Father Abraham. And may we apply them to our lives as messed up as we are, as flawed as we are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being willing to offer us your righteous life that we accept today. And may we grow in our daily relationship with you as we allow the power of your Holy Spirit to create the fire inside of us. Bless us now as we leave this place of worship and may others see Jesus in us, we ask and pray in Christ's name, amen.